students. So I'm going to go ahead and get us started and open up the floor. So today is really about the students, but my name is Kara, and I work up in student support programs as an AmeriCorps. I am part of Benefits Hub, and we are on campus five days a week to help students enroll in public benefits, um, engage with financial coaching, and um, get access to public and community resources. So um, this week, as Funding Week, has really been about how to help students access things on campus that are at their disposal to make college and educational goals more attainable for them and less stressful. So today, our COSI event is going to be centered more on the students, less on us. I want to have each one of the students just introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about what your educational goal is here at Seattle Central. And from there, we can sort of dive into how we've taken steps to fund that goal and barriers we've had to overcome in order to get there. Okay, well, my name is Adrian Tenney, and um, I'm a first year student um, studying social media services. Louder. Okay. My name is Adrian Tenney, and I am a first year um, student studying social and human services. Good afternoon, my name is Karen Patino. I am studying business. My goal is to transfer to the UW uh, Foster School of Business, and um, dream goal is to work for our Seattle Public Schools. Hi, my name is Rob Buck, and um, I'm on my, about ready to start my second year of uh, the engineering program, and I hope to transfer to the UW. Uh, my name is Jay, and I'm in the Social and Human Services program here. Um, hopefully with the plans to transfer to UW School of Social Work. My name is Marvin Chapman. I am currently working on my Associate of Science and I'm planning on transferring into computer engineering also. I'm tired of being broke. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So as we know, college has a lot of intricacies that we aren't necessarily made aware of before we enter. Um, these institutions with our goals of pursuing higher education, and that can be really tricky to navigate. So what I want everyone on this panel to get the opportunity to discuss is um, how you stepped out on this journey to college, and if you had any barriers when you were enrolling and trying to find funding and enroll in funding that you had to overcome. Does that make sense, everybody? Yeah, so I can start, I guess. Um, for me, my experience with um, getting funding and everything, it wasn't, I didn't really have a hard time. Um, I was very determined to come to school and I reached out to every service that was out there to, that could help me. One being um, WorkSource was available um, through this through the college through here, and I found that, um, you know, I was eligible for many things because of um, my need for food stamps, public assistance, and um, I don't want to stay on that type of income for the rest of my life, and for a long time I was, like, focused on just being comfortable with that, and you know, I'm making some change. I have made some changes in my life, and you know, it. You know, I just, um, I just found that by reaching out and asking for help, it it, it was there, and um, the work source specifically department has been very helpful in in the process of me getting funding for school. As a result of being part of that program, I am um, eligible for two years of paid tuition through that program for my um, associate's degree in social services. Um, and I have the ability to go on in, into the bachelor program here. However, that will be the challenge after them because they won't fund it longer than the two years. So, 
I'll um, cross that barrier when it does come, but um, my financial aid and everything has been very swift since I've been in here in school. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And there's also some workforce paperwork all on the table if anyone wants to learn a little bit more about that too after we're done with the panel. Um, we're gonna continue on and thank you so much for sharing, Karen, to you. Okay. Um, Sorry, I wrote a little bit of notes, I won't forget. Um, but the journey has been difficult, um, as most of us have actually come across. Um, I didn't think about coming to school just because m my deal was work, work, work. You know, I have a kid to support. Um, so with that being said, I, you know, I just thought about there has to be some way to actually get some funding without working so much. Um, there, there's actually programs out there called Seattle Milk Fund is one of them. Um, you just have to have, you know, 3.0 GPA and show them that you're enrolled full-time. Being a student who's enrolled full-time can actually be a barrier as much as how much should I actually work? How much can I work? How much do I have to work? Um, and so DSHS requires that parents who are enrolled full-time work 20 hours minimum in order for them to pay for childcare. How is that even possible that a parent has to work 20 hours on top of being a full-time student and still be a parent? It's a barrier. So that was one of my challenges. Um, you know, I've come across that, and another one that has helped me tremendously is the school scholarship program. Doesn't matter about the grades, just apply. That's a huge one. Um, a barrier that I also had was I'm a first-generation American. My parents are both from Colombia. And so being the first one to actually attend college, I really needed to look out what are my resources, who's going to be there to help me. And thankfully, I ran into the student parent support program, and Vanessa Unti is a coordinator there. So she's definitely helped me out a big, big amount. <laughs> so thank you. Say <laughs> shout out to Vanessa. <laughs> These student parents in the audience, please connect with her afterwards. Mm -hmm. She's amazing. Definitely. Thank you so much for your honesty and like. We appreciate your work and your participation here on campus and on this panel. Thank you. All right. Rob, would you like to? Yeah, what was the question? You want me to rephrase the question? Yeah. Okay, so um, please just uh, tell us a little bit about what your journey was like coming to college and accessing the funding options that you have now and any barrier that you had to overcome when trying to access that funding. Well, when I started, when I started going to school, back in the 90s and stuff like that, I was really young and stuff. And so what I did is I did the financial aid thing and I took out a bunch of loans and everything. Just uh, wasn't really serious about going to school, spent a lot of time partying and ended up dropping out. So one of the barriers that I've had to deal with was uh, when you do that and you don't make the payments and stuff like that, your loans going to default, of course. And uh, so one of the things I had to overcome is get those loans out of default. And I did that by getting a hold of the Department of Education and, uh, you know, they got a real easy program for people in situations like that. They just said, basically, if you're just willing to make some kind of a commitment, you know, $5 a month, whatever, just make payments for a few months. They, then they took my loans and they, um, how do you say, they consolidated them and put them in a lower interest rate, got me out of default so I could come back to school. However, that's not the end of the story. So I went back to school and uh, I got some grants. I wasn't taking out any loans and stuff like that, but I got really sick right after the, qu the quarter started. I got sick and, my, and I had a, and I had a baby and I couldn't continue. And so um, I had grants that that were unpaid. So that's another challenge that I had to do is, is for me to come back to school and be here today. I had to just set a goal and say, you know what, I got to pay those grants. You can't. I had to pay the grants back, and that was just like huge. For a long time, I was like, I want to go back to school, but I can't do it unless I pay that money back. And I didn't want to let go of that money because I've got a kid and everything going on. So for me, it was like uh, just. You know, I had to make a decision. It's like I can't keep doing the work I was doing. I'm getting a little bit older and stuff. I had, I had to make a decision, make that commitment. So that was another challenge. And, and then, of course, the biggest challenge, too, with just going to school for anybody is just the idea that uh, waking up every morning and reminding ourselves that we could do this, you know. Uh, that, that was huge for me. So I, outside of the financial thing, and, and like today, I get um, just the regular grants and stuff like that. I got a scholarship, a STEM scholarship. Which, like she said, yeah, I'd encourage anybody to apply for scholarship. I did not think I would ever get a scholarship, but I did. I got a nice one. And it allows me now to, uh, 
I live real meager, um, but my school's paid for, and I got a little job just pay my, just pay my child support, you know. So, because my my focus right now is, is just school. I just want to graduate, you know, and that takes a lot of uh, a lot, you know. I, I somebody has to work. I tried this last quarter. I worked 20 hours a week, and uh, just with 12 hours of credit, not having a kid, and I was just like, ah, oh, I gotta quit. I gotta go down to 10 hours a week. So yeah, that's kind of like where I'm at with it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thank Rob. Um, we actually also, just to touch on a little point that Rob made, um, Ramon Kanaf, who is the education case manager for the 7th uh, district, um, Pramila Jayapal, has some paperwork back there on the table. So if you are in the position where your loans are in default or you need to consolidate them, need help figuring out a payment plan, um, he left a page, a little packet of information with his business card and also an application for loan consolidation that we can help you with in our office up in 31, sorry, 3215 in student support programs. So I'm going to hand it off to Jay. So my name is Jay. Um, we already went over that. <laughs> so uh, I graduated high school in 2008, so it was 10 years ago. And um, I was in rehab for eight months before I came to Seattle Central. And while I was in rehab, I decided I wanted to go back to school. Um, and I was terrified of the process. I didn't even, like it was a big scary headache. Um, but I took a leap of faith and I came into the school and I realized that the first step that I needed to take was the testing. But I was in rehab, so I'm basically homeless. And um, I didn't have any money for that. so. One of my mottos in recovery was like, if there's a will, there's a way, if there's a way, there's another way. And so um, you just got to ask around for it. And so um, they took me to one of the school counselors, uh, her name is Lori something. Um, she wasn't actually my counselor now, but um, they wrote off the, fine, the pay fees for testing. So you don't have to pay for the, um, the placement tests, which was super cool because that was a lot of money I didn't have. Um, I got that done, and um, I heard from people on the street that there's a program that would pay for your, your school uh, if you got food stamps. So I did a little bit more looking into the VFET program here, um, and I got enrolled. And um, it was super awesome because they provide four quarters of uh, either your tuition, books, and transportation. Um, and so it's been a really awesome uh, help. I also got, I'm on Pell Grants now. Um, I did do college before this and had a whole bunch of student loans, but fortunately, but unfortunately, I had a job like six years ago with a fat tax return and they got me. So I didn't like it at the time, but I like it now. So that's pretty, pretty much where I'm at now. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jay. My biggest barrier in coming to school was probably a lack of information. I was always under assumption from just people I talked to that, oh, you go to school, you're going to have a hefty loan that you have to pay off, or there's a lot of money that you have to pay back, or I'm constantly talking to people that are saying that, oh, I still have student loans, like $20,000. $20,000? Why ain't got $100? You beat <laughs> So that lack of information is a big factor with kind of pushed me away from going to school until I started talking to people and was able to get a little bit more information. I, mean, uh, I recently found out about the Seattle Promise Scholarship, which I was like, what, you want to help me pay for school if I get a 3.0? It's the easiest thing I ever heard of. <laughs> you pay me to go to school? I'd be stupid not to accept something like that. So luckily I was able to get awarded that last quarter. I just finished my first quarter with that, and then I'm actually eligible for Pell, for a second chance Pell grant, and that's going to help me finish out paying for my next two years of school. And just not having that information is crazy. It's all the information is out there, and I kind of feel like a lot of people, especially in my communities, are not even aware of all the different payment opportunities that one can receive. And I just was in the hallway earlier. And they had the UW transfer thing, and I was talking to one of the guys, and, he was, and they're like, yeah, if you're eligible for Pell, you're eligible for the Huskies Promise College. I said, what's that? He's like, 
as long as you as long as you maintain a 2.0 or 2.5 and you're getting billed, we'll pay for all your tuition. That information, and I, I'm not, I might have heard one person say that out, outside of the person I talked to today. And, and I mean, I've been at this school for a couple quarters. I know a bunch of people that are involved in school, uh, numerous friends that have been to the UW. I'm like, how is this information not out here that people aren't even aware that look? We understand that there's people that are broke out here, but if you want to go and get educated, then you have an option. And I think another barrier for me might have been is that my mom, she didn't go to college. I mean, she, she's a little bit older than me. You know, she's my mom, but uh, <laughs> I ain't gonna throw that out there, but I want to say she said she didn't even finish high school if she went through, so not even having a lot of people around me that we're going to college, most of my other friends and family all just work. They're all workaholics. So when you're surrounded by workaholics, you just feel like, oh, I should go get a job as opposed to spend a few extra years in books because not that money is into gratification. Yeah, I'm not very. You actually don't seem like a, a little extra job funding to be an infomercial person for the Promise Scholarship. <laughs> <laughs> Watchboard.com, you just sign up on there, you just put in the sweepstakes, sign up for a sweepstakes, you might win $2,000. <laughs> click, click. I mean, they're, they're giving away money. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right, so we have another panelist that just showed up. Sorry, That's okay. So, please my, introduce yourself and let us know your academic goal, and then we'll Okay, so my name is Tiffany. And um, at this point, my academic goal is to be a better paid nurse. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, at some point, maybe going as far as nurse practitioner. But um, it's a really fun thing to look at the different programs when you transition into higher nursing. And then what, depending on where you want to go, it, it changes from your prerequisites to your time to when you submit the application. So just better paid nurse is the overall goal. Um, and then my barriers. So I got the GI Bill, which theoretically works really well. Um, there's a lot of details in there that they don't tell you. So uh, the Montgomery GI Bill gives you a lump sum or your lump sum to your school and then you get what's a remainder and it's uh, not considered unearned income. The 911 gives you a stipend for living and it is considered unearned income so therefore it disqualifies you from public programs. I am a single mother with three children and another adult who's my younger sister who's also going to college and they're like, oh, you make too much money. So one of the choices that we had to make in my family was everyone goes to school or all the adults work because of the family um, income, our household income, the biggest barrier was going to school actually hurt us in that we couldn't get any other help. Um, and paying for college works really well in theory. <coughs> well in practice because a lot of times one thing will disqualify you for another thing. Um, for example, before my GI Bill kicked in, BFET was like, yes, absolutely, we'll help you. Not so much, which is fine um, if everything works like it should, but it's the, the biggest barriers when there are hiccups. For example, if you get an eye in a class because, you know, your life blows up and you're like, okay, can I take this test over break? Sure that disqualifies you for financial aid the next quarter. And so you're like, this. It, the biggest barrier is waiting on promised money. So whether it's the GI Bill, the Pell Grant, uh, a Stafford loan, a scholarship, it's the fact that you can't tell the school, no, no, I promise you, I, I'm going to pay it eventually. This person said they would. Um, that's one of the bigger barriers for me is Theoretically, the financial aid is there. Sometimes it's not there in reality, and you cannot put your life on hold. Once you dedicate going to school, you can't get a job for two weeks between break. Like, that doesn't work well. <laughs> and if you want to do um, a work study, that's awesome too. But sometimes your schedule doesn't fit in with the office that you're going to or reality. 
sometimes class schedules don't fit in with reality, so you spend, for example, I live in Tacoma, I spend at least three hours on a train every day to go back and forth because I get more BAH, which is the subsidy for housing through the military, going to Seattle by about $700. Like, that's the difference between, like, my kids get fruits and vegetables or my kids get top ramen and hamburger. So I have to make lifestyle changes based on my funding, and the funding is theoretical until it's in hand. So that's one of the big barriers, is you cannot plan for a lot of things, and I have no safety net. A lot, a lot like the other people on this panel, my parents didn't go to college. I am fairly certain my parents went to high school, but other than that, yeah. I don't have anyone to educate me through this process, and a lot of the, the systems, I didn't know they were there until I already didn't need them anymore. Thank you so much, Tiffany, for coming and giving that. Blowing through that one. Yeah, <laughs> no, that was great. That was great because I think a lot of us don't know the intricacies of GI funding, and so it's really good to hear it from a student perspective rather than from a the theoretical package standpoint it's where it's all wrapped up. great if you're a single person with no responsibilities. If you have no responsibilities, the GI Bill almost pays for almost everything. Not if you have a family. You're really shooting yourself in the foot at that point. Thank you. So I think we might be ready to move on to some of the next questions. You guys have answered these questions so comprehensively so far, so it's almost like answering my follow-up questions. But um, if you could uh, talk a little bit more specifically about some of the payment options that you have accessed um, and used to pay for school and what it was like actually applying for those, what the process entailed, and um, I know that we've mentioned the Promise Scholarship, Emergency Funds, um, Work Study. So if any of like some of these programs apply to you, Workforce, FAFSA, whoever wants to just popcorn and talk a little bit in depth about which one you might have applied for and how you got that, that would be awesome. I was like trying to encompass every because you guys have talked so much about the funding options you're already doing, but I just wanted to um, pose the question um, if you could pick one of the particular funding options that you are utilizing and what the process was for obtaining that a little bit more specifically. So if you are using work study or the Promise Scholarship or BFET. How did you apply for that funding and who, which department did you talk to for anyone in the audience who isn't quite as familiar with that? I can do that. I can do work study. Mm -hmm. I can do a BFAT. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Yay. So FAFSA, FAFSA is really interesting because there have been some recent changes. Um, I think we're still going off the 2017 tax return. Um, which is cool because you theoretically get it sooner, um, but it also sucks because my income now, <laughs> compared to what I was making in 2015, I was still active duty, so ooh. Um, I don't feel like it accurately reflects one of my biggest problems with FAFSA is when you're anything outside the typical or the norm or the stereotype for who's supposed to go to college, there are some weird questions, because I had even filled out FAFSA when I was like pre-military, pre-marriage and divorce, and since I was under the age of, I think it was 24, they wanted my parents' information. I'm like, my parents haven't filed taxes since, yeah, no, my parents don't file taxes. So it became a barrier, because not only did I have no one to help me fill out the paperwork that really understood it, I didn't have access to that information, and having your FAFSA a day late can make your entire year miserable, and you might as well just stay screwed and not start for another quarter, because it's so difficult if anything is wrong, um, and the unfortunate part is it can be wrong and have nothing to do with you, and it still inhibits 
um, your ability to get funding if you cannot just magically come up with however much tuition is. Thank you so much for making that point. It was extremely important. I have a similar experience with the FAFSA and that under 24 requirement. So I think that's a lot of things that people don't know and don't consider all the time. But we do have two representatives from our financial aid office if you two would like to introduce yourselves and they'll be able to answer questions at the end. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's interesting to hear a uh, student's perspective for sure. Uh, but my name is Kyle, I'm the director of financial aid. Um, so a lot of the things that you were just talking about, some concerns that you have, and we could definitely address those as you guys need it. And my name is Valu, Assistant Director of the Financial Aid Office. Thank you so much. All right, so we will move down the road, come back this way. Sure. I'll talk about scholarships. Yeah, I'll talk about some scholarships. <laughs> <laughs> They're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Scholarships and grants. Loan or a last priority, if you ask me. But who asked? <laughs> I'll just, I did. <laughs> that's an important question. I, mean. I got the. I got said earlier. I, I received a Seattle Promise Scholarship, and it's funny that she was saying something about FAFSA because I, I didn't even think about FAFSA initially, but me turning my FAFSA late was a bit of a barrier that if I didn't. See the Seattle Public Scholarship, I might have been in trouble <laughs> because I didn't even. I know I wanted to go to school, but the opportunity came upon me so suddenly. I literally had maybe a, a couple weeks to a month. Like, hey, you're about to be in the area of the school. You should fill out this paperwork if you want to go. And I was like, man, I ain't got no money. I felt this fast for and signed up for a Seattle Public Scholarship. I said, I promise, man, you know how much I hate you know, personal statements? Just give me like long math. I'll do hours of math before I write a personal statement. So it was like, no, fill it out. It'd be fine. There's no personal statement. I said, you for real? It's like, they were thinking about me? So after I, after I filled it out and I turned it in, I got it accepted. I was surprised. It's like, whoever those people are, I'm very grateful. They're pretty amazing people. They deserve a pay raise. But fortunately, I, I was able to obtain that, so I was able to come to school and start my first quarter. But I was not aware that they sell books like the Mafia. Oh. <laughs> and I had no idea that books were so expensive, and I was lucky enough to be eligible for emergency funds to help me pay for my first quarter of books because my teachers were not trying to hear anything about not having books like a week and a half into the quarter. I'm like, look, you don't know how I was like, look, I don't want you in my personal life, but I got situations outside of this that's forbidding me from having these books right now. I just can't go to the bank and just have some money. They're like, no, hey, you got final studies? I'm like, so when my account is working, I don't have that access right now. So, I mean, that, that scholarship definitely helped and also, I met a, a nice gentleman that was in the financial aid office that really helped me take care of stuff and let me know of a, a form that you can fill out if you are if you have a extenuated circumstances behind why your FAFSA would feel that way. And he was very understanding. <laughs> <laughs> so, he, and so he definitely let me know about that and that helped me get some of my funding released so I could Help pay for stuff for school. So I would definitely recommend the Seattle Promise Scholarship and the foundations. Those are amazing people. And signing up for any scholarship, even if you don't think you have a chance, if you don't take a shot, you ain't never gonna make it. Can I point out, <laughs> can I point out something really quick? You said about books. So if the government gives me a thousand dollars a month and I can never afford books because the government says that's how much our books are supposed to be, maybe that means that you're right and books actually are way too expensive. Like that can be the huge breaker if you're like, okay, they gave me X amount of dollars and I have to sell one of my kids to get my textbooks. Because like, 
they're insanely expensive. How much are those kids going for? <laughs> uh, about three calc books at this point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, awesome. One of the things that I didn't mention in the barrier question, not to like backtrack, but I'm one of the few students here in the school who lives in low income housing and is a full time student. Mm -hmm. So I have the like hookup on like how to not. There's a lot of loopholes that people don't know about, um, especially with that one. And I know a few students here who are unfortunately living homeless because they're full-time students. So um, if anyone wants to ask me about that after the meeting, that would be great. Um, <clears throat> so BFET, I heard about it through the grapevine, and I did a little bit more looking up. And I uh, was like, oh, OK, I received food stamps, so I'm going to look into that. Um, they have like a ridiculous eight hour orientation. Um, I couldn't possibly real figure out what they could talk about for eight hours. But it was somewhat helpful um, because uh, they spoke a lot about other sources that weren't just their funding sources, so other scholarship programs here. And they basically drill it in your head that you should never pay for anything. There's always money out there floating around, um, and for me, luckily enough, like I've got a lot of minority um, tags that I can tag on for free money, which is cool. Um, but yeah, so they've got an orientation. I think you sign up online, or you make a phone call, um, and then you sit through this orientation, and it gets you hooked up for registration. And see, I was already registered and all of that before I went to this class, so. I think it's part of the reason I was like over it. But um, it's a cool program. It's a lot of like moving papers. You gotta move a lot of papers. You gotta do it in a quick amount of time. So they ask for monthly progress reports. Um, you just gotta fill it out, get it in. Um, you have to reapply for each quarter. And um, what did I just send them? Sent them something. Sometimes they ask, they re recertify like your funding. Um, it's only for four quarters though. This is a, the thing I try to like remind the people that I, I get put into PFET. I'm like, so they're only gonna pay for four quarters. So if that looks like um, one quarter is you're only gonna use books and parking, then that means you lost out on tuition for that quarter too. So for me, I'm on Pell Grants and all of the other stuff. So I haven't been able to utilize my, um, my tuition from them, but I've utilized my books and my parking pass. So just take them for whatever they're gonna give you and, and move forward. So I think I'm in my third quarter of BFET and I probably am going to um, drop out of the BFET program doing possible changes in uh, my educational circumstances. But, we will see where that goes. But it's a really good program, especially for people who don't know about it. Um, I have a friend who, right before this quarter started, I told him about it like last second, and he's like, wait, what? And he got in right before the deadline, and like he's like so happy that um, I told him about that because he was worried he was gonna have to take out loans, and it was the perfect fit. So, a little it, update, they did drop the eight-hour orientation, so now you get the event <laughs> And they're for workforce training programs only. So that's that's the huge catch, is that for people, they only have a list of certain programs that they pay for, and those are usually the ones that are like technical programs, like the SHS and the chemical dependency programs, things that are gonna get you out of school within like two years and then into the workforce. So um, if, you're work, if you wanna transfer, like get a transfer degree or anything, you won't qualify. But if you are working for your workforce training program and then think you might need to change, 
towards the end, you might need to drop out of out of it. They don't need to know about that until after. That's right there. Thanks for catching that, Jay. Yeah. That's called BFIT. BFIT. Is it basic food education training? Mm -hmm. Yes. The same pot of money gives you a worker retrain, and mm -hmm. then there's another, there is the, yeah, the opportunity so you can qualify if you're, like for me, they're like, if you're out of the military in the last four years, I'm like, wow. Okay. So um, change it, like if you're a homemaker and you get divorced, if you're on food stamps, if you're recently. Um, out of work, or you have uh, you were laid off, and then I got the last. Oh, if you're on unemployment, you can qualify for it too. Like there's this cool little umbrella of people who need more education. And the, and the other thing that I forgot to mention is that it'll give you the opportunity to keep your food stamps. Like that's the major one, right? Mm -hmm. You get to keep your food stamps yep. while you're in college because a lot of college students lose their food stamps because their final trade is considered income, and it bumps them out of the bracket. Yeah. Thank you, too. So I have to talk a little bit about the scholarship, um, and I guess a little bit about the FAFSA. Uh, the scholarship is just, uh, for me, I, I saw a thing online, I applied. I had to have a specific grade point average um, and a personal statement. Yeah. I went and talked to one person and, and I wrote a personal statement and I thought it was good and she, you know, and I explained to her like what my circumstances really were and she said, man, you got to sell yourself. So I just went and I just like, blah, and just told them and uh, yeah, I got the scholarship. But one thing I want to talk about too on the whole FAFSA thing is when I decided to come back to school, um, I had just moved here. I had a good job. I've been with the company for quite a while and uh, they were getting ready to move. Um, out of the area, and uh, I was in the process of trying to figure out how I was going to work that job and go to school. So they they left, uh, and so when I when I signed up for the FAFSA, I had made too much money, and uh, so they weren't going to give me any funding. At the same time, the company was leaving, and I had to make a commitment either go to school or move with the company. And uh, I chose to just stay here, go to school. So I took out a couple small loans just to pay for um for the classes for the quarter. And, uh, you know, and I thought that was it, you know, and I, and I did. I lived really broke there for a little while. And, uh, but I, I, I felt like I was doing what I wanted to do. Like I was just doing, doing my thing. But um, one thing that they didn't tell me about, and I'm talking, I've talked to these financial aid people a few times at the front desk, and somebody had mentioned to me that I could go in there and tell them I had a substantial income drop from one year to the next. And they said that you could put that in there because they look back like a couple of years on your income. And they said you could put in a form and they'll look at that and they'll change your whole Pell Grant thing and stuff like that. And I'm thinking, okay, I gotta wait till the next quarter. And I've talked to these, you know, a few times, and I guess it's kind of a, like a barrier. It's just like miscommunication. The guy at the counter and stuff like that. I've talked to him several times. He knew I was waiting, but I talked to a different individual at the counter, and she's like. I brought all the paperwork. I said, I want to set up an appointment so that the next quarter I can maybe get a Pell Grant and stuff like that. And she's like, you can do it for the last two quarters. And so I went in, like the lady, the, the lady was just super nice in there. And this is just like kudos for financial aid people, man. And she pulled me in there and she went through all over everything. And uh, like, so I got a bunch of money from the previous two quarters for the Pell Grant. So I was like, so that was, uh, Really, yeah, that was a cool experience. It's like that doesn't happen all the time. And for me, you know, like with the books, and I, the two quarters ago, it was six hundred dollars for two books and a couple of books for, um, and myself, I'm a for, formerly incarcerated individual, so that kind of opens uh, doors to a couple little programs that they don't really advertise a lot. Um, but this uh, Pioneer Housing um, is uh, they work with people that have been convicted, um, that's gone through the system, but they helped me pay for my books. And they don't, they don't advertise that, because a lot of people are gonna try to abuse the system and stuff like that, but um, it, I know that there's money there, and that's one thing about like going to school right now, is when I look at my, I, I look at my finances in a different light today, it's like, you know, it's like not my focus. I just know that everything's gonna work out. I know that there's places I could go, and there's there's programs in place, so that's one thing that going here. I, I do know that, and I, I feel comfortable about that. With that I'll just throw. Was the money that you got um, from financial aid that the back? It, did it go 
towards former quarters? Did they drop it on you? Like they at just back pay? at back pay. It was like I, you know, I thought that I, I was doing it for for the next quarter that they were going to look at my income, readjust my financial aid or my EIN number, whatever that number is. Uh, that's so important. Uh, they were going to adjust it and. Uh, I thought it was just going to be for that quarter, but the girl said, no, well, you could do it for this quarter, too. So they set me up with an appointment. Like I said, that lady was really super cool and just, you know. Square dealer. Yeah, 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 it was nice. Stuff like that doesn't always happen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Ralph. We're going to keep it rolling just so I can get our last two panelists in and then open it up to the audience for questions and also to our financial aid folks that are here if anyone has any more targeted or specific questions about that. Um, but yeah. um, so what I believe was two quarters ago, but that's sort of back me up here, um, <laughs> because we had so many donors um, not too long ago, um, the program was able, student parent support program was able to actually cover the fees of our textbooks. Um, sadly, we've, we've lost a couple of donors, um, so now, you know, we've, they mm -hmm. chunk of change there, so um, that's happened recently. Um, so if there's any way that, you know, maybe we can get those donors back or have them hear us, I mean, I all support, yeah, <laughs> send it. <laughs> um, I think that'd be great. As far as um, housing, um, the city of Seattle, I mean, we all, we all know it, the rent is ridiculous. It is crazy expensive. Um, but one resource that I have found on my own, no one told me, I had no idea this even existed, was the MMTE. And it stands for Multi-Family Tax Exempt Program. And the, these awesome new buildings, actually this one has it too, um, they have 20% of their units that are discounted units, like you don't, you're not even paying like market price, like it is fairly low. And my family and I live on Madison. Um, you know, we're both, my fiance and I, we're both students and we have a child who attends preschool. So the fact that we can just stay in the area helps us so much. So if you can, you know, find an MFTE unit, King uh, County, I you don't qualify. Oh, okay. I mean, if you want to move closer, I don't know how that works. I pay like $100. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just a weird scenario, yeah. but it's, uh, I, my landlord's awesome. <laughs> like, when the government <laughs> shut down yeah. back in 2000 yeah. and whatever, he's like, oh, no, you don't have to pay rent until they pay you, so I'm not leaving. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Stay, <there. laughs> Stay put, but for those that, you know, need to live closer to school, which I know helps tremendously, especially if you're taking night classes, which I am, um, I mean, one night class, the restaurant one, thank God. Um, but, yeah, it was a barrier, you know, living a little further away. Thank you so much for that resource. Right. And so I was going to talk a little bit about work study. I did apply for work study through the FAFSA, and I was granted work study. However, when, when I was first granted work study, I had a very hard problem um, finding somewhere to do the work study. And um, the whole reason for me coming to school was to get employed, become employable. So um, I think that, that that was a barrier. It is a barrier. Um, here at the college because in the resource center where their the jobs are listed, it's like day one, you have to be qualified to do something. So it kind of um, defeats the whole purpose of getting worse or doing it. So that money was just sitting there in financial aid and I wasn't able to use it until <coughs> this quarter when I finally found an off-site work study position somewhere. I found somebody to hire me. And, you know, the good thing about it, that is that I'm also getting work experience. So. Yeah. All right. So work studies, depending on where you get them, pay differently. So like, yeah. I, I was going to Tacoma Community College, which, disclaimer, the reason I go here is because you guys have better administrative systems. It's not just the increase in pay. Like, my FAFSA went through faster. Every Everything worked a lot smoother. Um, and that I credit to the diversity of the popula the student body population. So, I'm, which is awesome. But as far as the work study goes, 
If I do a work study here, I get scalp minimum wage. If I do it at Tacoma, I get Tacoma minimum wage. If I do it for the VA, I get um, the state minimum wage. So um, I found out there that there's a big, like, with work studies, like it, there's no guarantee. And then depending on what the work study is, there's a cap to how many hours you can work in a week and then how many hours you can work total. <coughs> and it varies and it sucks. Well, I just want to say thank you. I'm your favorite work study. That's <laughs> <laughs> like because it gets work with us. Do I? <laughs> <laughs> I'm surrounded by a great team, and I, and I definitely realize there's some issues with work study, but I would say anyone that does have an opportunity for work study, go out and talk for them, right? Go mingle, shake a hand, meet a friend, talk to some people in some different offices and see what they have going on, because I don't even know if the place where I work study even had a work study position, but I was talking to them and they're like, well, we could use some help doing this. I was like, well, I just got work study. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, just talking to, to people and just mingling could open up opportunity for yourself. Awesome. All right, fantastic. Thank you all so much on the panel for sharing your experiences and your expertise and navigating this complex system. I'm really proud of you, and it's been really awesome to get to sit on this panel with you guys. So thank you so much. Um, just a really quick announcement for anyone who's going to try to head out early before we take questions. We do have lunch provided as informed on the flyer. It will be in um, the Student Support Program's office, BE 3215, for the next half hour. So if you can come back later and grab a slice of pizza, please do. Um, but before that, if anyone in the audience has a question or anyone on our financial aid panel over here, yes. Well, can I just say one quick thing Absolutely. real quick? Um, totally. Yeah, just wanted to mention that uh, we have some surveys for folks to fill out since we're kind of at the end of their time, but y'all can keep talking and, and chatting and asking questions. So. But if you can fill out some surveys, folks who attended, and hand them uh, to Julian on your way out, that would be excellent. And uh, there's also books up here in addition to the materials if you're interested in uh, other materials on the tablet. Yeah. Yes. Oh, no worries. So we have a question in the audience. Um, if you would mind introducing yourself to the panel and then asking your question. Sure. Um, my name is Mary Ann. I'm, uh, I'm in the programming certificate track. And I get um, worker training money. Um, but I've been told that I'm pretty much exhausted what I can get because I've gotten three quarters. Um, but I want to extend my certificate to an AA, which is technically allowed within the like, worker retraining category and short programs. But I've been told that I can't really get more quarters of funding. But I'm wondering if there's other options. Are you talking about VPAT? Or are you talking about loopholes? Worker retraining. So she's. What do you know? <laughs> um, and maybe if we could talk after the session as well, but um, wondering if within worker retraining you're aware of options for people who want to maybe go from like a four quarter certificate to an associate's if you've had experience with that. <clears throat> so, my sister is not a veteran, not a mom, and she's under 24, um, but if you want, I can tell you after this, not while we're recorded, um, okay. how we got her paid for, because she actually, like, my sister's lived with me since she was 15 years old, like, she's 24 now, like, we are a team, we are a dynamic duo, um, and Everyone wants to give me money. No one wants to give her money. So if you want, we can. Yeah, There's lots of loopholes, by the way. Did you apply for the scholarships? <laughs> Should we just rename the panel to loopholes? <laughs> yeah. Pay for college. Loopholes. We'll call it we'll call it life hacks. Financial life hacks. I did one life hacks. Yes. Yes. I did. Did you? Uh, I applied. I applied, but um, I wasn't able to get it because I got my last quarter of the Mm -hmm. um, money so that uh, preempted the, forget, the one of the foundation scholarships. 
um, what this would be like. Are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> Um, panel will workshop yesterday and Leanne from the foundation is here. I don't know if you're willing to answer some questions about the foundation scholarship maybe afterwards and then financial aid as well. We can probably talk to you about a few programs that can help with your paying to complete your program. But cool. Thank you. I think that answers my question. Perfect. Awesome. Anyone else have a question? Let me put Karen on the spot. <laughs> um, Karen, um, can you talk about your experience with um, the cost of your child care and, <laughs> and how that has affected your um, ability to come to school and you, what resources you've used? For sure. Um, so the cost of child care is more than your rent. <laughs> yes. Um, and, you know, especially if they're still in diapers, depending on a certain age, and that depends on how much you'll actually get funded for. Um, for example, my son, he was in daycare uh, last year. Uh, well, he started school this year, but last year, um, last school year, he was in a daycare on Yesler 22nd, and their tuition was $1,600. And that- A month. A month. <laughs> and it's not, yeah, it's not per quarter, it's a month. And it's, and I, I believe 22nd and Yesler Central District, I mean, it shouldn't be costing that much. That's more than rent. Um, and so for me, I needed to find a way to, you know, help fund that. Um, Seattle Milk Fund would send a check directly to daycare, but will only cover $1,500. I still have, you know, uh, and $1,500 a quarter. Yeah, a month. A not quarter. a month, a quarter. Um, so Seattle Milk Fund, you know, they took a month away from me, but, um, so on top of that, I needed to apply elsewhere on top of what I was receiving from Seattle Milk Fund. Um, so I applied with DSHS. I got approved, but their requirements were work 20 hours a week and be a full-time student. So that to me, I mean, when he was at that daycare, I remember going to bed at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning writing papers and studying when, you know? It's like I still had to be a mom. I still had to work. 20 plus hours because there's not many jobs out there that will actually let you work just 20 hours. Um, and you know, the days that I did have to work when he wasn't in daycare, um, that was difficult because then on top of that, you have to find someone else to watch your kid and pay that person for that. Um, school at night, you know, there's not a lot of daycares that are open at night. Um, so that was another barrier. Um, but. I want to say, you know, I've overcome that. I've actually enrolled my son in a private school where their tuition is more than half of a daycare. Um, he's happy, I'm happy, and, you know, he's practicing our religion, which is Catholic, and I'm happy that, you know, they're showing him that in school. So, always, <laughs> always another way. Um, but yeah, that was my experience. <laughs> Can I ask you a loaded daycare question? Yeah. So, okay, like, when it comes down to it in daycare, do you find as a parent that you are terrified to not pay, like, when it comes down to this whole, well, I could pay $700 for daycare here, mm -hmm. but I'm terrified they're going to lock my kid in the closet, mm -hmm. versus anything that's yeah. decent, you're, like, looking mm -hmm. at... Like, I don't know why, but it's always at least half of your paycheck. Absolutely. I mean, a, a decent daycare that I would have enjoyed him attending was uh, Bright Horizons just down the block, but that's 2300 a month. <laughs> Wouldn't and they don't and they don't receive um, they don't accept um, subsidies. Checks. Yeah, they don't accept subsidies. So would it make so. a difference for you for daycare? Like, if you had so, like. I got to transfer up here after my, like my youngest is in school now, and I can transfer up here. Would it make, I know it made a difference for me, would it make a difference for you, like the proximity of the daycare, the quality of the daycare, Absolutely. and all those other things, like, mm -hmm. are those other barriers that you had? Yeah, absolutely. I needed to settle for the one that I was able to afford at the time where I wasn't having, you know, all this funding, because it took a while for DSHS to actually approve me. Because I needed, you know, I needed to find that job that would actually allow me 
to work the 20 hours or more. Um, I needed to find, um, what else did I need? The waiting list, the open Oh, list. luckily, you know, when I applied, um, I was, you know, I actually called some, some program I called and they gave me a whole list of, um, I want to say it was like, a, it's like certified uh, daycares by the state. Mm -hmm. And so I was going down that list, just calling like, do you have an opening, do you have an opening? And the one on 22nd and yesterday they did. And so, I mean, I got the tour, it was, it's an old house. It, it didn't look like somewhere where I want my child to be, but um, I kept, you know, I kept in there like, you can walk in here whenever you want, I felt comfortable with that. Um, I looked online to make sure that they didn't have any um, type of reports that were just like not necessary. Um, so, you know, just as a parent, you, you also have to do your research. So I feel comfortable leaving my child there, yes. Um, would I would I've enjoyed him attending a better one here, closer to, you know, to me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Um, sadly, Seattle Central used to have a daycare. <laughs> <laughs> Um, before but I, time, but before I get time. it, you know, it's it's expensive, and I know, you know, the cost probably was kicking the school's butt. Um, but if there's a way that we can maybe get that back for future parents, you know, who want to actually come to school and would feel comfortable to have their kid in the same building, yeah, that'd be great. Are you one of the uh, BFET students? Are you BFET student? Mm -hmm. So another way around that would have been that if you are involved in a workforce training program that would have been approved by DSHS, then you can hook yourself into that by going to school is counting as your 20 hours of work. Oh yeah, yeah. They, they needed, um, that was one thing that I, met, I failed to mention was that they needed a schedule of when he was going to be at the daycare and what was my schedule like, my school schedule and my work schedule. So they needed like proof of all this. And you also have to be on a track that is professional or technical, which isn't yeah. the path that you want. Mm -hmm. So it's really limiting. <clears throat> yeah. No limitations at City yeah. That's a barrier. Um, but I work for Ingram High School now. If any of you guys are interested in working at a high school, tutoring our opportunity youth. Yeah. I enjoy my job. Yeah. <laughs> Like to make? I have a comment. <laughs> 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 I 